Okay, it's time. We should get started. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gonji Nani. Yes, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> so Gonji is uh, uh, at the CFA, as a Harper Society of Fellows, yep. where she is a PhD as well, publishing a lot of papers <laughs> and studying and working with a lot of people. Uh, today, uh, Gonji is going to tell us about uh, new results of a very old problem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great introduction. Um, today it's my great pleasure to be here to discuss about the dynamics of hierarchical three-body systems. And my main collaborators on this project include Smada Naus, Fancy Coxis, Matt Holman, and Avi Loeb. So what is a hierarchical three-body system? It is a system where two of the objects are very close to each other, and the third object is very far away. And this kind of three-body system is the so-called hierarchical three-body system. And why do we care about this kind of systems? We care about this kind of system because this kind of hierarchical configuration can be quite common, especially if a binary starts with short periods. It has been found that for binary stars with periods less than about 10 days, more than 40% of them have outer companions. And for binary stars with even shorter periods of less than about three days, more than 90% of them have outer companions. And for three-body systems in particular, about more than 90% of them are hierarchical. And this makes sense intuitively because the hierarchical systems are quite stable. You may notice that in the examples above, I do not only include the three-body systems. However, uh, we can start with the three-body systems first to understand the multiple systems because they can give us some insight on the dynamics of multiple sy hierarchical multiple systems. Okay. So I think for binaries which are further than ten days, it's only ten percent of them. Or yeah, but uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, and this comment is only for like the very hierarchical where the yeah where two of the objects are very close in already. Yeah, thank you for the comment. So what is the dynamics like? So for the hierarchical configurations, we can treat the two closely separate uh, objects as a closed binary that is perturbed by the further object. And in this case, the angular momentum of the inner binary can be extracted by the outer object. And the eccentricity can increase, and the separation at the pericenter can be reduced. So the two objects can be brought closer to each other, like this. OK, and also the outer object can torque the orbit of the inner binary and change its inclination. So the inclination of the inner binary can also be changed, like this. So this kind of dynamics can be applied to a large variety of astrophysical systems. First of all, for stellar systems, it has been observed for some short period stellar binaries, the distance between the two stars are shorter than the minimum distance where they can be formed of. So this mechanism can help to bring the two stars closer to each other after they are formed and help explain the origin of the observed short period binaries. And secondly, for blue stragglers. Blue stragglers are type of stars that are bluer and brighter than the other stars in the cluster. And they can be formed by the collision of two stars. However, the collision rate is not high enough to explain all the blue stragglers. And this mechanism can help bring the two stars closer to each other and has the possibility to collide with each other. So this mechanism can help explain the origin of the blue stragglers. And similarly, for type 1a supernova, one of the ways to produce a type 1a supernova is via the collision of two white dwarfs. And this mechanism can also help enhance the collision rate of the two white dwarfs by bringing them closer to each other and help explain the type 1a supernova origin. And next, for the exoplanetary systems, different from our own solar system, some of the exoplanets have very different orbital configurations where some of them have eccentric orbit. And this challenges the classical planetary formation theory. And due to the, in this mechanism, due to the perturbation of the outer companion, the eccentricity of the planet orbit can be excited from a circular orbit to eccentric. And this mechanism can help explain some of the eccentric exoplanetary orbits that's observed 
such as for the 16 Cygni B and also the HD 80606. And in addition to the eccentricity, some of the exoplanets are also quite different from our own solar system objects since they have large spin orbit misalignment, meaning their orbit are quite misaligned with the spin axis of a star. And this also challenges the classical planetary formation theory where the planetary system is formed from a giant molecular cloud which has a preferred direction of rotation. And as we've seen that this outer perturber can track the inclination of the inner binary. And in the case of the stellar spin axis is not strongly coupled with the planetary orbit. The spin axis of the star is left alone. And this way, the outer perturber can track the planetary orbit and produce the spin orbit misalignment that is observed. And finally, for the black hole systems, for the binary black holes, the outer perturber can excite the eccentricity of the black hole binary. And this significantly reduces the uh, binary merger rate due to gravitational wave radiation. And this can enhance the merger rate. And this is very important for gravitational wave rate detec uh, detection rates calculations. And in the end, when the star is brought closer to the supermassive black hole, the stars may be tidally disrupted. And since the outer perturber can bring the stars closer to the supermassive black hole and produce these tidal disruption events, this mechanism is important in the calculation of the tidal disruption rates. So now I hope I've convinced you that this mechanism is very important. It can be applied to a large variety of astrophysical systems. So we're going to, in this talk, we're going to discuss the dynamics of this kind of system. I'm going to start with the interesting mechanism we find where the inner binary can flip by about 180 degrees from almost coplanar configuration. And then I'm going to discuss two examples where the theoretical dynamics can help produce misaligned hot Jupiters and also can in help enhance the tidal disruption rates of stars. So let's start with the coplanar flip. Before going to the details, let's look at the configurations of the system again. As we mentioned, that the system is quite stable. And we can treat the closely separate two objects as a closed binary. And out, we can treat the outer object uh, orbiting around the center mass of the inner two objects as the outer binary. And in this case, the orbital phase uh, movement is uh, the orbital periods of these binaries are much shorter than the interaction time scale. So one can average out the orbital motion of the two binaries and treat it as the interaction of two orbital wires, where the inner wire is composed of the inner two objects and the outer wire is composed of the outer object opting around the center mass of the inner two objects. We can use J to denote the angular momentum of the inner uh, orbit and the outer orbit, and we can use I to denote the mutual inclination between these two orbits. So this kind of dynamics has been studied uh, long before in the literature, specifically in 1990s, um, Kauza and Lidov studied the um, dynamics uh, for the solar system objects. And it's for those cases, um, the outer orbit eccentricity is zero, and one of the inner object has, is a test particle where its mass is zero. And um, they expand the Hamiltonian in power series of semi-major axis ratio, which is small number for this hierarchical configuration. And it is found that the octopole level is zero, and the quadruple order, which is semi-major axis ratio to the second power, sufficiently describes the dynamics of the system. Specifically, the z-component angular momentum is conserved since the in, for the inner orbit, since the inner orbit is in axiosymmetric potential. And also, when the mutual inclination is higher than 40 degrees, the eccentricity and inclination of the inner orbit can vary with large amplitude, as shown here. We plot the eccentricity and inclination as a function of time, and we can see that the eccentricity can be excited from almost zero to very large values. And inclination can also oscillate with large amplitude. And this kind of oscillation is the so-called causal lead of oscillations. Mm -hmm. What gives you the time scale of Ah, so the time scale is due to the outer perturber. So you can calculate the time scale. Um, that is roughly the one, one cycle of these oscillations. Um, from the, 
um, from the uh, uh, equation of motion, you can roughly calculate the time it takes for the uh, argument periapsis to liberate once, and then roughly it can give you the um, time scale. And roughly the time scale scale says the mass of the perturber to the inner um, object and um, um, to the power of one and the semi major axis ratio to the power of three, because this is ch a tidal type of interaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the case when the eccentricity is non-zero or when the one none of the inner object is a test particle, uh, the z component angular momentum of the inner orbit is no longer a constant, and the octopole level is no longer zero. And in this case. It has been found that when the mutual inclination is over 40 degrees, the eccentricity not only can be excited to large values, it can also be excited very close to one. And when the mutual inclination is over 40 degrees, inclination can cross over 90 degrees. And we can get this since the z component angular momentum is not a constant, so this can flip sign, so the inclination can cross over 90 degrees. And this is showing the figure here which plots the inclination and the one minus eccentricity as a function of time. The cyan color shows the case when one only includes the quadruple order, and the red color shows the case when one includes both the quadruple order and the octuple order. So you can see that for the inclination, including the octuple order, the inclination can flip across 90 degrees, and including the octuple order, the eccentricity can be excited very close to one. So what are the consequences? Why is this interesting? This is interesting because since the inclination can be crossed over 90 degrees, it can not only produce the misaligned hot Jupiters or misaligned X planets, it can also produce planets that orbit in the opposite direction from the spin axis of the star, where the mutual inclination is over 90 degrees. In addition, as the one minus eccentricity goes very close to zero, meaning the pericenter distance is further reduced, so this can further enhance the tidal disruption rates. So now you may wonder, what will happen if the inclination is outside of this range? As you can see that here, the inclination is constrained between about 40 to 140 degrees. So, yeah. yeah, and so, and later in this talk, we'll see the histogram of the, the spin of the misalignment. It's quite interesting. Thank you for the question. So, um, yeah, back to the uh, Kauplaner case. So, um, what happens if the mutual inclination is outside of this range when the two orbits are almost called planar? One would expect that nothing very interesting will happen because the torque is smaller when the mutual inclination is smaller. However, however we find when the, uh, inner in when the eccentricity of the inner orbit is large, meaning the angular momentum in the, of the inner orbit is smaller, uh, something interesting can still happen where the inner eccentricity can still be excited to one and inclination can almost flip one by 180 degrees. And this requirement is needed because when the angular momentum of the inner orbit is smaller, it's easier to flip the inner orbit. And this is shown in the figure here, where it plots one minus eccentricity and inclination as a function of time. And now we can see that starting from almost zero degrees, the inclination can oscillate and then flip by 180 degrees. And during the flip, the eccentricity can be excited to very large values to 1 minus about 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 5. The green color in this plot shows the results from the secular approximation up to the octuple order that we've seen in the semi-major axis ratio expansion. And the dashed blue line is the results from n-body simulations. So you can also see that the secular results agree quite well with the n-body simulations. So this. Yeah, it can it can survive through the flip because during the flip, the two orbits are still the two um, the system is still quite hierarchical. So the semi-major axis expansion is still valid. Yeah. Um, so basically, from here we can see that the inner orbit can flip from almost zero degrees by about 180 degrees, like a pancake. Okay, <clears throat> so why is it interesting? It's interesting because it increases the parameter space 
where the eccentricity can be excited and inclination can flip. So this also shows that it is possible that um, hot Jupiters can orbit in the exact opposite direction from the spin axis of star since the inclination can go to 180 degrees. And it also shows as the eccentricity can be excited to large values, this can enhance the tidal disruption rates. So what are the differences between the high inclination flip and the low inclination flip? We can see the trajectories here which plus one minus eccentricity and inclination as a function of time for the low inclination flip and the high inclination flip. So you can see for the low inclination flip, the eccentricity increases monotonically before the flip, while for the high inclination flip, the inclination oscillates before the flip. And this oscillation is on quadruple time scales. So why is this there, why is there this difference? We're going to discuss about this later in this talk. And also we can see that for the low inclination flip, the inclination is quite low before the flip, while for the high inclination flip, the inclination is quite high and oscillates um, before the flip. So the, the flip happens when the eccentricity gets to extremely high value. Oh, yes, so you the worry flip. That you might disrupt the planet? Yes, we do worry. We worry. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's why um, population synthesis model is, it will be very helpful because with the tides and the, a lot of precessions during the flip, it's quite complicated. And then from that, we can obtain the fraction of systems that have been tidally disrupted and survived. There's still some portion of the uh, systems that can survive and end in the, um, some misaligned configurations. But we'll discuss about this later in this talk. Uh, sorry? Oh, uh, yeah. That's a very good question. We will later see that for the low inclination flip, this is regular, so the time it takes up to flip is roughly the same. However, for the high inclination flip case, sometimes it's chaotic, and this may not be the same. Okay, so what exactly is the flip, uh, does the flip look like? So here I include a, mo uh, a movie to show the low inclination flip case. Where in this case, for simplicity, we use a test particle limit, where one of the inner object is a test particle, has mass zero. And in this case, the outer binary is stationary in the capillary orbit. And we can align the z-axis of this movie with the angular momentum of the outer orbit. The colored ring is the inner orbit. The black arrow shows the direction of the colored inner ring, and the pink arrow shows the z component of the black arrow. So when the pink arrow flips, it is time when the orbit flip. So are you ready for the movie? <laughs> so now you can see that orbit precesses regularly to the left, and inclination also oscillates, and the orbit flips, and then it precesses back. Looks quite regular. Do you want to see it again? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and you can see it precesses and inclination oscillates and then it flips and then it precesses back. So what's it like for the high inclination flip? And this is showing this movie. Where similarly we take the test particle limit and align the z-axis with the angular momentum of the outer orbit which is stationary and the colored ring is the inner orbit. Again, the black arrow shows the direction of the inner orbit, and pink arrow shows the z component of black arrow. So I'm going to play the movie. And now we can see that for the high inclination flip, the orbit processes in a faster time scale than the flipped time scale. And the orbit just flips. Yeah, and do you want to see it again? <laughs> I can see that orbit processes and flips. Please. So does this necessarily happen on a, a, a slower time scale than the orbit itself here? Or? Oh, the orbital time scale is much faster than this. Otherwise, the secular approximation is not valid. Yeah. So, so for the system that's very hierarchical, this time scale is much longer than the orbital time scale. For the outer perturbator, if the outer perturbator is closer in, and then this may not be the case, and then you need to do embodied simulations. But sometimes it could be chaotic, so can there be resonant effects that break that? Or uh, yeah, there are resonances. Actually, this excitation with eccentricity and the inclination variation are due to resonances, as we will later see. 
fact, the resonance is a secular resonance, and it doesn't break the theoretical limit. OK. So you may wonder, for the kind co uh, coplanar flip, it looks quite regular. Can we get some analytical predictions on the flip criteria and the flip time scales? To study this, let's first look at the Hamiltonian of this system roughly. So in the, um, for simplicity, we take the test particle limit. So one of the inner object is a test particle. And in this case, the Hamiltonian can be reduced to two degree freedom, which depends on the angular momentum, the argument of periapsis, the Z component angular momentum, and the longitude of node. Um, and up to the octuple order, the Hamiltonian has this kind of form where we can see that at the quadruple order, it's independent of the longitude of node, meaning its conjugate action is a constant. So the Z component, so we can see that the Z component angular momentum is constant as expected. And at the octuple order, it depends on both of these two angles. So both angular momentum and Z component angular momentum are not constant. This epsilon is a theoretical parameter that characterize how important this octuple term is relative to the quadruple term. And this depends on the semi-major axis ratio and the eccentricity of the outer orbit. When the outer object is closer, the octuple term is more important. And when the eccentricity of the outer object is higher, this is more important. So if you just included the quadruple term, would be one degree freedom? Uh, yes. Uh, if you just uh, include the quadruple system, the whole system is integrable. And yeah. Oh, it's the outer, the outer eccentricity. I was wondering what. Uh, yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. This is the outer eccentricity. Yeah, you too. Okay, and then for the coplanar case, we take the first order inclination, and then we can see that the evolution of eccentricity only due to the octuple terms. So this explains that the eccentricity do not oscillate at the quadruple time scale before the flip. And also, we can find that at the first order inclination, the system only depends on the angular momentum and the longitude of Paris center. So this can be reduced to a one degree freedom system. And the system is integrable. And also, we can solve the eccentricity as a, time, as a function of time directly. And from this, we can obtain the flip time scale and the flip criteria, showing what during the flip, the eccentricity goes almost to one. Specifically, the flip criterion can be expressed uh, as the expression shown here. And it depends on the uh, inner orbit eccentricity and the, and the longitude of the Paris center, which is the mutual inclination between the inner orbit and outer orbit. Briefly, it's easier to flip the inner orbit when the inner eccentricity is higher or when the angular momentum of the inner orbit is smaller. So it's easier to flip. And also, it's easier to flip the orbit when the longitude of Paris center is around 180 degrees, when the two orbits have 180 degree anti aligned. And this is the case when the interaction of the two orbits is stronger. So we can compare the analytical results with the numerical results to see how robust this criterion is. The left panel shows the flip criterion in a plane of the theoretical parameter and the inner eccentricity. The solid black line is the analytical result. And the colored uh, crosses and pluses are the results from numerical simulations. The green pluses are the numerical simulation that do not flip over about 10 to the 4 quadruple time scale. And the blue crosses are the rounds that do flip. So you can see that analytical um, results agree quite well with the numerical simulations. And also, uh, on the right hand side is the flip time scale. The colored crosses are the results from the numerical. Mm -hmm. uh, are the antibody simulations still with a test particle? Oh, uh, that's a good question. This is not a result from antibody simulation. This is a result from the secular integration at an octopole level. But this is the analytical results from taking the first order inclination. Yeah. Um, so you can see that um, the crosses are the numer secular numerical results with different initial eccentricity, and the black, solid black lines are the analytical results for the flip time scale as a function of the hierarchical parameter. You can see that analytical results agree quite well with the numerical results. 
So what causes the inclination variation and eccentricity excitation? And as we've seen that for the high inclination flip, it looks quite complicated. And whether they are chaotic. To study this, we use the surface of section, which is the intersection of the trajectory. And we can tell from the in, uh, surface of section the chaotic regions and resonant regions. Specifically, the resonant regions are the <coughs> regions where the points fill one-dimensional lines and the angles are constrained in a restrict restricted interval. And the trajectories here are quasi-periodic. And also there are chaotic regions in the surface of section that we can see, where the chaotic regions corresponds to points that fill a higher dimension than the one-dimensional lines. And the trajectories there are chaotic. So this is the surface of section for the test particle octopool level uh, approximation. Um, the first row corresponds to a smaller epsilon, so the quadruple term dominates. And the second row corresponds to a larger theoretical parameter epsilon where the octopole term dominates. And each different column corresponds to different energy levels, where roughly to the left the mutual inclination is lower and to the right the mutual inclination is higher. From the y-axis, which is angular momentum, we can roughly tell the eccentricity from this plot where <laughs> the eccentricity is lower when angular momentum is high and vice versa. So we can see the resonances in this surface of sections, such as around here, around the here, and around here. These are the points that fill these one-dimensional lines. And, um, and we can see compare with, and we can see that um, these ones are due to the quadruple resonances, as in the first row, these re regions are larger than the second row. And also, <coughs> there are also some resonances at high eccentricity region, such as around here. And this is due to the octuple resonances. So you can see that the octuple resonances cause the eccentricity excitation. And these resonances are a combination of the mutual orientation of the inner and outer orbit. And also we can see the chaotic regions in the surface of section around here. And these are due to the overlap of the quadruple resonances and octuple resonances. And these are the trajectories corresponding to the high inclination flip. So you can see that some of the high inclination flips are chaotic. So how chaotic are the high inclination flip? To study this, we can obtain the Lyapunov time scale or the Lyapunov exponent for this um, high inclination flip. As a reminder, the Lyapunov exponent characterizes how quickly two trajectories diverge from each other. The larger this exponent, the more chaotic the system is. So this is the Lyapunov exponent as a function of the energy level and the hierarchicity parameter. And the red region corresponds to the high inclination flip. So you can tell that the Lyapunov uh, time scale related to the high inclination flip is roughly six quadruple cosine time scale. So for some of the high inclination flip, the system is chaotic over about six cosine time scale. Uh, so at high energies, um, it's, this is a very interesting. So at high energies, it seems like the two uh, resonances do not overlap. Like this one, so where the quadruple resonances go to the lower eccentricity end. And then for here, the, um, and it can be seen clearly here. So for this high inclination flip, it's no longer chaotic. Yeah, it's, I think it's not very trivial to think about this uh, intuitively. If it's, so. For the high inclination flip, sometimes you can see the orbit processes quite rapidly in the XY plane. Um, yeah, but basically, for the high inclination flip, this does not overlap. OK, <clears throat> so next, let's apply this mechanism to exoplanetary systems. So it has been observed that there are many planets outside of our own solar system, and many of them are very different from our own solar system planets. For instance, there are very massive planets uh, very close in to their host star or the so-called hot Jupiters. It's difficult to explain the origin of the hot Jupiters as it's difficult to form them in situ very close to the star. 
And as the theoretical uh, three body dynamics, the outer perturber can enhance the eccentricity of the planetary orbit and can move the planet closer to the star at the pericenter and then tides can help bring this uh, planet there. So these dynamics can help uh, produce this kind of hot Jupiters. And during this process, the inclination of the planetary orbit can vary. So one can use the spin orbit misalignment to help constrain how dominant this mechanism is in help producing the hot Jupiters. And this is the histogram of the observed Spin orbit projected spin orbit misalignment, and we can see that for many systems, the spin orbit misalignment is quite large, and this can be a byproduct as the formation of the hot Jupiters using the theoretical three body dynamics. Um, so next, I'm going to show that using the coplanar flip that we've just seen, that the planet orbit can be flipped by 180 degrees and to produce a planet that is. Uh, orbiting in the direct opposite direction from the spin axis of the star. As shown here, where the planet initially orbits in the same direction as the spin axis of the star in an eccentric orbit, and due to the perturbation of the outer companion, the orbit can flip by 180 degrees uh, like this, and during the flip, the eccentricity can be excited very close to one, and at the pericenter, the distance between the planet and star are very close, and this allows tides to operate. And tides can circularize the orbit and shrink the orbit to produce the hot Jupiter that are very close to the star and the orbiting in the 180 degrees from the spin axis of the star. And this can be shown in the numerical simulations using the secular uh, regime here where the upper panel plots the mutual inclination and the spin orbit misalignment as a function of time, and the lower panel shows the eccentricity and semi-major axis as a function of time. So we can see that during the flip, the eccentricity can be excited to very large values, and at the pericenter, the distance is close, so it, under, so it allows tides to operate. And under tidal dissipation, the orbit can be circularized and shrink, and this way you can get a hot Jupiter that is almost uh, 180 um, uh, misaligned with the spin axis of the star. And during this process, the stellar spin axis is not um, moved significant, significantly. And this is actually a very fine-tuned configuration because this heavily depends on the operation of tides. So if tides can um, operate earlier and they can circularize the orbit and shrink the orbit before the orbit flip exactly to 180 degrees, and in that case, it can end up with hot Jupiters um, with lower misalignment. And also, as Chris Tobel pointed out earlier in this talk, during the flip, the eccentricity can be excited to very large values. So if you check the pericenter distance, it may reach the roach lobe limit before the circularization and shrink of the orbit. And in this case, the planet may be tidally disrupted. So, mm -hmm. the eccentricity is very high. How did the tidal dissipation time scales you're using compare to the flip time scale? Yeah, <coughs> during the, um, when the eccentricity gets very high, it actually depends. So when the parent, it depends, because tidal dissipation time scale is a function that's very sensitive on the distances. So, um, so during the flip, it can, it, in some cases, it can happen that tidal dissipation time scale is quite fast, and then it can win, wins over. But in some cases, um, it can be directly disrupted before it gets to. I guess what I'm getting at is from the dynamics you said, and you mm -hmm. talked about this just a slide ago, that fine-tuned, it seems like the more generic thing will be that as you approach a polar orbit, you should drain away and search the rest of the it's, it's not always the case because when you add in the tidal dissipation, it's not exactly the case when it's polar, the eccentricity reaches the maximum. And it may happen that the tidal interaction is strong enough before you reach the maximum eccentricity. So, yeah, yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is that it seems like that very high eccentricity phase seems like a barrier to the full flip because yeah, you that's lost true. a lot of your eccentricity there, it's harder for you to continue through and lose more eccentricity and land on the other side. Yeah. So statistically, is it 
reasonable to have many? Yeah, and uh, in terms of statis uh, statistically, and um, people have done population synthesis, and it is found as we will later show. I think it's the next slide. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it's very difficult to tell the, the final mutual inclination um, um, just from direct analytical estimation on the flip time scale and the tidal dis tidal interactions. So. <coughs> Um, Christopher Petrovich has done a very exciting study on the coplanar high eccentricity migration for a planet due to the outer planet, not only the um, coplanar flip scenario. Using the population synthesis, it is found that from the numerical simulations, um, the uh, projected spin orbit misalignment is represented by the solid black line, and then from the uh, observation, it's represented by the red line. So you can see that. For this scenario, when the uh, planet is per perturbing an inner planet, most of the final mutual inclination is quite low, below 40 degrees. So you can actually not explain the origin of the high uh, misalignment case. And for this, we got to ask Chris, are you including tidal realignment in this? Method? No. Oh, but actually, I think for tidal re realignment, it is found at least for the equilibrium tides. The tidal decay time scale is similar to the realignment time scale. So for most of the cases, you realign the orbit when the planet dies, got engulfed by the star, unless you use some uh, equilibrium, t uh, unless you use some inertial dissipation, inertial wave dissipation instead of the equilibrium tides. tides the so yeah. when it's circular horizons, it could be tides yeah. on the star. That's mm -hmm. realigned by the uh, number yeah. that's actually included. Yeah, but I thought tidal realignment, realignment is known to be happening right now. We see the uh, less massive planet, uh, less uh, misaligned. That's, that's, I think that's still um, like this, like debatable because it may not due to the tidal realignment. It may due to some other mechanism where it probably doesn't get misalignment in the first place. So there's still some like um, controversy in whether tidal realignment really play a role for the small planets. For the Co-star and small planets. <clears throat> okay. Uh, next, um, how does this apply to stars around supermassive black hole binaries? Oh, the conclusion is uh, for uh, so the perturber of the outer companion can produce misalignment, but from recent studies such as the eccentricity comparison uh, for the observed systems and the results from the population synthesis, it seems only about 20% of the systems are uh, the misalignment are due to the perturbation of the outer companion. So in order to mm -hmm. tweak the York, you need to decrease the outer momentum by a lot. So like in one cosine time scale run, you that's the game over here. So uh, and for, to do that, you need to start with a line that is really, really fast like a few tens of asteroid and something like that. So one minus C can get down to 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 1. And that's, I would say, kind of unlikely, given that we know that most planets are, are roughly at a few of you inside the new. Are you saying the binary which you need to make the No, no, not the binary, the planet. The planet needs to start migration at, say, 50 U or something like that. So one minus C. Given, given where the binary is, the planet has uh, it's, 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 yeah, one requirement, so, so the flipping condition is actually a condition to reach eccentricity unit, and it happens that it flips. To reach eccentricity, uh, the values for the flip to happen, they are so large that the very center, if you start at 1 AU, would be inside the star. So you need to actually start migration from 50 AU or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and this population sequence in particular, is taking data from greater velocities where we believe the planets are quite so that's kind of like that. There's no population that can uh, for this only for this scenario, for this scenario where the planets initially are quite close. If you start with them. Um, right. Yeah. No, no, this is secret. This is circular. Yeah. So so yeah, so it's it's possible to have the depending on the the orbit. Yeah, and then uh, I Maybe a little bit fine too, and the planets you need to start uh, from you need to start like very far out. Yeah, as you can see around uh, here. So, like in your uh, 
Right. Yeah, and you can so see that the planet set, uh, like forty, uh, so more than ten AU. Right. And for this. Yeah, no, no but finally, in the end, it can reduce this to a very close distance. Just uh, before the flip, it was quite far away. So in the end, you can get RV. It can be responsible for RV There's planets. No But this is the initial configuration. So unless you're just looking at the very young systems, and then you so can. Right. So that's right. the thing. They, they, mm -hmm. We really thought there are less planets there. No planets. No planets there, and there are many planets that want to. So that's. that's yeah, but I think it's still possible to have some planets at that far distances. Given, although now the RV is just more favorable for the short period planets. So I think this can still happen for some population of the yeah, planet. Micro lensing mm -hmm. constraint, I think um, that's, that's, that's farther away from this distance, right? Hi. Not. Okay. The direct imaging? No, well. Direct imaging is farther, it's about like a 50 to 100 AU, some of them. Probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So if you do population synthesis, you reproduce the flat tail at the. Uh, I didn't do population synthesis myself, and Chris Bell did some. Right. Uh, I think for the I think for the um, perturber, if the perturber is a star. There are some past literature is finding that there are misalignment above. Ah, sorry, I can do this. <laughs> I'm giving away all the little, little things. Let's see. I should have it. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So this one is the companion is a star instead of a planet. And for that case, it has a large number of them with quite misaligned and retrograde configurations. No, but that, this is an inclined Yeah. This is a cosine, uh, eccentric cosine mechanism. Yeah, Christopher was a coplanar case. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it seems the population synthesis do depend a lot on the initial conditions, where you put the planet, how coplanar the outer perturber is, and what is the mass of the outer perturber relative to the planets. So. Yeah. No. No. Right. And even for this case, it was found the eccentric causality of mechanism may be responsible for about 30% of the hot Jupiters, comparing with the misalignment. Theoretical three body dynamics on, uh, on stars around supermassive black hole binaries. So it is well known now that there are supermassive black hole binaries existing in our, uh, in our universe, where the supermassive black hole binaries may originate from the mergers of galaxies. And that large separations, about a about kiloparsec separation, these uh, supermassive black hole binaries can be directly imaging such as from the X-ray image here. At closer separations, at about one parsec separation, it's more difficult to identify the supermassive black hole binaries. And one can use the photometric and spectral features, but it's also quite difficult to identify them. So in this talk, I'm going to discuss the identification of the supermassive black hole binaries at about one parsec separation due to the using the stellar features. Mm, specifically, we're looking at stars around the primary supermassive black hole, and the other supermassive black hole is a perturber, like this. So the perturber can. <laughs> okay. So so the perturber can change the um, configuration and the trajectories of the uh, stars and can affect these stars. And from the imprints on the stars one may tell the existence of the supermassive black hole binaries at the short separations. One motivation for this, uh, so, so for this case, 
Um, because the star mass is much smaller than the black hole mass, and it, we can roughly treat it as a test particle. And the uh, stars and the primary supermassive black hole can form the inner binary and the outer binary is a perturbing supermassive black hole around the primary supermassive black hole. How far are the black holes? Uh, so here we are considering about kilo, one parsec scale, and later on, hmm? okay. yeah, and later on, well, I'm going to show the sweet spot of the separation of the supermassive black hole binary that more of the stars are affected by the constant of oscillations. But stay tuned. Okay, <laughs> one motivation to study this is during the theoretical. Uh, dynamics, the maximum eccentricity can be excited to very large values. So the pericenter distance can be greatly reduced. And this means the stars can be brought very close to the supermassive black hole and be tidally disrupted. This is shown in the figure here, which plots log of the one minus the maximum eccentricity for four different snapshots, um, where this one is to for about 30 causality of time scale. Um, we can see that in about 30 causality of time scale, the um, max eccentricity can reach about 1 minus 10 to the minus 6. So this means it's very powerful, where the stars can start at a million times further from the tidal disruption radii and still have the possibility to be disrupted. Uh, I think for at uh, least for the disruption, when the time wise it's actually disrupted, it's about 10, uh, three, 10 to the three years, 10 to the four years, so it's quite short. Very short. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's a very good question. I'm going to show a plot of these time scales very soon in in this talk. So yeah, I think it's the next slide. So um, we need to be very cautious about this uh, excitation of the eccentricity. Because, as we mentioned, that this eccentricity excitation are due to resonances. So if the resonant angles precess at a time scale faster than the causality of time scales, um, this, um, pre this resonance may be suppressed, so the eccentricity cannot be excited to very large values. So in this plot, we um, plot all the different time scales with the um, causality time scale represented by the red line here as a function of the stellar semi-major axis. So you can see that um, this is the case for the primary supermassive black hole is 10 to the 7 solar mass and perturbator is 10 to the 9 solar mass. So you can see that when the star is very close to the supermassive black hole, the GR precession time scale is really short. So it can suppress the eccentricity excitation due to the uh, outer perturbator. <coughs> But farther away from the supermassive black hole, the stars may be outside the Hill sphere limit, or when the theoretical, uh, theoretical approximation may break down. So the stars cannot stay very far away from supermassive black hole. So in this case, um, the stars are affected by the causality of oscillations only in the, green, in the range of the green arrow. So from this, we can calculate the total number of stars affected by the causality of oscillations for different configurations, um, as shown here, <coughs> which plots the total number of stars affected by the causality of oscillations as a function of the outer perturb mass of the outer perturber and the mass of the um, primary supermassive black hole. Um, we can see that the curve here represents the region where the causality of oscillations are suppressed by the Newtonian precession. And this is a precession due to the stellar potential interior to the star that we consider. And this curve represents the region where the causality of oscillations are suppressed by the GR precession. And the colors shows the log of the total number of stars that are affected. Mm -hmm. What do you think the eccentricity? We don't actually, I don't know the answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm not very sure. I think from some of the simulations, the eccentricity can be high. But uh, I'm not, um, I think, I think a 0.7 eccentricity is a reasonable eccentricity. But, um, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is the eccentricity of the black holes. As the black hole is merged in, and then it can be 
uh, move inward due to some scatter of stars and then the mass segregation first and then some scatter of stars. And in some cases, it can be end up quite high with quite high eccentricity. But this eccentricity doesn't need to be very high for this to operate. But I think this is a um, quite uh, this is a reasonable eccentricity for the supermassive black hole binary. Yeah. Yeah, but um, uh, we don't know. I mean, I didn't do geonumerical simulations. I remember looking up in the literature where it shows that it can be eccentric. Can I find the literature for you? But I don't remember. I don't remember the authors at this moment. Yeah, but, <clears throat> but firstly, let me finish on this part, and this shows that the causality of oscillations. Oh, oh uh, what uh, NT precession? Thank you. This is a Newtonian precession due to the uh, stellar uh, potential. Yeah, so it's different from a point mass potential. So you can see from this plot that causality of oscillations affect more stars when the perturber is actually more massive. Although when the more massive black holes may have more stars, however, when the perturber is more massive, the perturbation is stronger. So uh, it's still for the less massive primary supermassive black hole, more stars are affected by the causality of oscillations. So next, about the dependence on the binary supermassive black hole orbital parameters. <coughs> So here we can show the same thing, the total number of stars affected by causality of oscillations for different supermassive black hole um, semi-major axis and different eccentricity. So you can see that there is a sweet spot around about one parsec, supermassive black hole binary uh, semi-major axis about one parsec. When the supermassive black holes are further away, the precession due to the stellar potential can greatly suppress the um, the causality of oscillation. And when they are closer in, less stars are within the huge sphere of the primary supermassive black hole. It's, it's kind of remarkable to me that the, the supermassive black holes are going to make 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 solar masses each. And this is just like a normal star, right? Like one solar mass. Mm -hmm. that's, and that's kind of, it's just. No, it's a, there's a star cluster. Yeah, there's a star, star cluster. cluster. Central star cluster? Yeah, yeah, there's a central star cluster that I'm putting for the Newtonian precession. Yeah. And then uh, the, uh, the row set for different uh, eccentricity of the supermassive black hole binaries. So you can see that actually when the eccentricity is lower at about 0.1, more stars are affected by the oscillations because when the eccentricity is larger, uh, more of the, uh, less of the stars are still within the huge sphere of the primary supermassive black hole. So what is the tidal disruption rate? for the case where more of the stars are affected by the causality of oscillations. So here we show a specific case of a primary supermassive black hole of a 10 million solar mass perturbed by a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole. And <clears throat> the final result is shown in the panel here, which shows the final inclination and final eccentricity as a function of the final semi-major axis. The red dots are the ones that have survived the uh, one billion year simulation. And the open circles are the ones that got disrupted. The color of the open circles shows the disruption time scale. And then the blue crosses are the stars that are scattered away from the primary supermassive black hole. So we tried a thousand test particles to simulate <coughs> this. About 50 of them got disrupted and about more than 700 of them got scattered away. So the scattered stars can change the stellar profile around the primary supermassive black hole. And also normalize this with the M sigma relation. We can find that tidal disruption rate can reach about 10 to the minus 3 per year. <coughs> and how does this affect the stellar profile? The first row is the initial histogram of the mutual inclination of the um, star relative to the binary black hole. And this is the eccentricity and semi-major axis. When the stellar eccentricity is higher, the stars are more vulnerable for causality of oscillations. So what we have in the end are the less um, eccentric stellar orbits. And we are left with stars closer to the primary supermassive black hole because stars further away feel stronger perturbation from the outer companion. So in the end, how, what is the case 
for the stars around the intermediate solar mass black hole in our own galactic center. So in this case, the stars around the intermediate solar mass black hole and the perturber is the Sagittarius A. <coughs> so this is the result. We assume this is the final inclination versus the final semi-major axis. So we can see that about 40 of them got disrupted and 50 of them got scattered away from the primary intermediate solar mass black hole. And in this case, about 50% of stars survive and tidal disruption rate can reach about 10 to the minus 4 per year. And interestingly, for this case, it can leave an imprint on the profile of the stars around the intermediate solar mass black hole, where for the mutual inclination of the stellar orbit with the, with the intermediate solar mass black hole and the Sagittarius A, there's a big dip when the mutual inclination is high. So this means, finally, the stars um, surrounding the intermediate solar mass black hole will be in the sh shape of a torus. So this can, has the potential to help us identify the intermediate solar mass black hole in the galactic center. So now here's my conclusion. So we've first seen in this talk that the inner orbit can flip by about 180 degrees from the almost coplanar configuration with the outer perturber, like a pancake. And in this case, it can help produce the misaligned exoplanets. Um, and it has the possibility to produce counter hot, hot Jupiters. And for the case of stars in the supermassive black hole binary systems, um, the perturbation of the outer supermassive black hole can enhance the tidal disruption rates when the perturber is quite massive comparing with the primary supermassive black hole. That's it, thank you. large uncertainties. Um, I think it's still around 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 per galaxy per year. Okay. But then what's the motivation to make it 10 to minus 3? Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. That's a very good question. So, um, so I think for some cases, um, I think I think not the tidal disruption case, but the scattering of the star may help uh, bring the supermassive black hole closer, but not in the secular case, because here the semi axis is conserved. Um, but from this, from this, one can help constrain the population of the supermassive black hole binaries. For the number I quoted, this is for the tidal disruption rates in general. But for binaries, where the binary can enhance the tidal disruption rates, and if comparing these rates, one can see, say, like how common are the supermassive hole black hole binaries as they are very difficult to be detected. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. So we use a power law distribution of the, um, for the stars so to get the um, potential of the star. So of, of about um, uh, Forgot the exact number, but um, but this could this power law could change um, moderately the final results of what's the region where the stars can be di disrupted. But you know. You show me in body that you have many ejections. Yeah. Also, we have to pump up this solar system by any of you extract ten to the eight stars or something like that. Uh, yes, definitely. The the uh, disrupt the ejection of the stars may be uh, may change the supermassive black hole binary configuration. Um, I think I think in this case because um, this is still in the secular regime, so the in the case where the stars actually uh, got ejected to the other system, this simulation itself is not valid. However, if a large number of stars can be ejected from the binary system, the, it can help the hardening of the supermassive black hole binary. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank Donji. Um, yeah.